Right. Can you guys hear me? Is that working fine now? Yeah. All right. Uh, as Carl mentioned, my name's James, but most people call me Jimbo. Uh, and we're friends here, so you can call me Jimbo or James or just Sir, I don't mind. Uh, it's been a while since I've been called Doctor, but that used to also be a title for me. And as Carl mentioned, I work during the week with Evangelical Students, which is a Christian organisation. Uh, it's not a church, it's a parachurch organisation uh, that instead of replacing a church, it seeks to be an extension of the local evangelical churches in Adelaide. And our goal is to help university students meet Jesus, grow in him, and then share him with others on campus. Uh, I know some friendly faces here. I can say Christine, who I've known through my time at ES, just embarrassing her again. Um, and ES's goal is to try and help every university student while they're spending their three or four years on campus to have the opportunity to get to know Jesus for the first time. Uh, if they know Jesus, to grow in him. Uh, and as I said, then to be sent with him wherever they go in life after that. Uh, and so ES does a number of different things. Uh, we have missions. Uh, so last year, when all of us were in lockdown with COVID, uh, we thought, how can we actually try and reach our friends when we're not on campus? And so we ran an online mission where we got 50 students to all record short two-minute testimonies, not of how they became a Christian, but how Jesus is currently changing their life today. We chucked them all up online in one go. Everyone liked each other's videos and they all went viral. And I think we got about 30,000 views over the kind of uh, two-week period that we showed those videos. Uh, so we try and see ourselves a bit as an evangelism incubator. Uh, you know, startups and tech companies, they always have like these R&D divisions which are trying to come up with the new things. We see ourselves as oppor providing opportunities for people to think about how they can reach their friends with the gospel while being faithful to the Bible, but in new ways that will reach the next generation. So we're always looking for those kind of opportunities as well. Uh, sometimes we do these kind of missions where we try and get people to uh, read the Bible with people. So this is Uncover. Uh, and I know I'm going to pick up Christine again. Christine has actually done this before with one of her friends on campus when she was a student on campus with us. Uh, and this is a really nice copy of Mark's Gospel. On one side you've got the text. On the other side you've just got a blank page. And the idea is that we invite our Christian students to invite their friends to read a biography of Jesus' life with them while they're there at uni. They grab coffee together. And if the student doesn't know how to do it, the staff sit alongside them and help them and the three of them sit down and we just ask five basic questions. Uh, we retell the story in our own words. We ask, how do the different characters react to Jesus in this story? What does Jesus reveal about himself through his words and actions? What reason did the author have for putting it in there? And then how might I respond to what this story reveals about Jesus' life? And so it's pretty uh, informal and casual. You don't have to be a Christian to ask those five R uh, questions. And we've found it's been really effective in helping people get to know Jesus. In fact, this year we've had two of our medical students become Christian for the first time uh, this year, which is wonderful news. Uh, and they did that through just sitting down with their friends on campus and opening the Bible and reading it together and meeting Jesus for the first time afresh in the pages of Scripture. Uh, so we'd really love your prayers because university is a bit of an overwhelming time. There's lots of challenges to faith. You'll see on the one side there, there's cold beer served on tap. And on the other side, there's an advertisement for a ball. Uh, there's parties, there's beer. There's lots of distractions which can take people away from their faith. And so we want to be a resource for the local church in helping Christian students to own their faith, to go deeper in their faith, and to realize that becoming a university student is not a time to abandon your faith, but to actually strengthen it and come out the other side, loving Jesus more and serving him better. Uh, and so we'd love your prayers for that. Uh, our objective, as I said earlier, is to reach every student of the gospel of Jesus. So um, how can you guys, as a local church, partner with us? There's lots of different ways, but if you want three key quick things, uh, one is you can pray with us and for us. Uh, so if you're not sure how to do that, come and gr grab me afterwards and I can uh, add you to our prayer newsletter list or let you know how you can find out more information. Uh, financially, we are a parachurch organisation. We don't ask the students to pay for us or to give money to us in a direct way because they're poor uni students. And so we rely on the support of local churches. And so if that's something you're interested in, come and let me know as well. Uh, and also you can send students to us. So if you know of university students or you are a university student yourself, uh, come along to ES and help connect us with university students because it's becoming increasingly harder with our O weeks are getting shrunk. And with COVID, we've not had O week in a real sense for two years now. Uh, and so we'd love to be connected with university students, either Christian or not yet Christian, who would love to be finding out more about this while they're on campus. Uh, so that's three practical ways. If you can't remember them, uh, don't text Carl because he may not have all the answers and you don't remember his phone number. Uh, maybe go and see Christine because she'll be a brand ambassador. I'm going to pick on her again. Uh, 
and she can, she can let you know how you can find out more about those things as well. Uh, but one practical key way is we've got our commencement camp coming up in February, that's the week before O Week, and we take away Christian students and people keen to find out more for two or three days to help them think about how to be Christian in this next chapter of life. Uh, it's heaps of fun, they get to make some friends before the scariness of uni begins, and so if you want to find out more about that, you can go to our website uh, or our Facebook group, uh, there's ES there or es.org.au, that's pretty simple to remember, and you can find out more information there. We're going to come to God's Word now, though, which is much more important than commencement camp, so let me pray. Father, we thank you for your Word, and we thank you that it gives life to us. And so I pray this morning that you'd help us to be able to concentrate, to meditate, and to respond with repentance and faith. Father, please set aside all the distractions that we've had this week, and help us to listen to what you have to say to us through your Son, Jesus, and the power of your Spirit. Amen. Uh, Well, this year, uh, Helga's Bakehouse commissioned McCrindle Research to produce the initial Kindness Index Report to explore the current state of kindness in Australia. The idea is that over the coming years, Helga's will not only give you bread, but also analysis of the trends of how kindness is developing and morphing in Australia. According to this groundbreaking research, Australia scored 74 out of 100 on the Kindness Index score, whatever that is. And surprisingly, here's the the cool part, Generation Z scored the highest. That's really good. Out of all the subgroups analysed, Generation Z, the future of our world, are in safe hands because they're the kindest people they could find. We like to think of ourselves as kind people, don't we? I'm a pretty good person, right? And as the report summarises, Australians are altruistic at their core. But here's the problem. I'm not convinced. (laughs) Because when I look at my own life, I know that I'm not intrinsically kind. A few weeks ago, on a Sunday, uh, after church, my family and I grabbed a quick lunch and we decided to go somewhere different. We came over here to the eastern suburbs. And as we were driving home, my two-year-old started screaming. It was her nap time and all hell had broken loose. Hell hath no fury like a two-year-old in need of a nap. And so I'm driving along home with a screaming toddler who sounds like a pterodactyl being murdered in the back seat. And there is this driver in front of me who's taking his sweet time. And and I'm like, oh, typical Adelaide driver, I say to myself. I try and work out ways to overtake them, but of course I can't do this because this driver's got a trailer on the back and they need more room to manoeuvre. And with each traffic light, my toddler's screaming intensifies and my rage at this driver is growing exponentially. And finally, I get to overtake this slow driver and as I zoom past, I look at them to give them a death glare and I realise it's Carl Robinson. (laughs) Driving home with the church gear. (laughs) Whoops. Sorry, Carl, I love you, brother. You're a great driver. I'm not a kind person. I'm not altruistic at my core. As Selena Gomez tells people, I'm not killing people with kindness. I am on my own a harsh, unkind, brash person. Kindness doesn't come naturally. Our world is harsh, and I think it's increasingly so. And we deceive ourselves by thinking that we are kind, but that everyone else out there, they're the ones who aren't kind. They're the ones with the problem. And even the Helga's research bears that out. Aussies said that on average they perform 16 acts of kindness per week, but that they only receive six acts of kindness from others per week. The math doesn't add up. We're losing 10 acts of kindness per person per week somewhere. (laughs) And I think it's because I overestimate how kind I am and I underestimate how kind others are towards me. I don't see kindness clearly. And part of the problem is that we can't really agree on what kindness is. According to the Helga's report, kindness was measured by looking at three domains. Empathy, altruism, and reflection. And each of those was further broken down to compassion, consideration, friendliness, encouragement, generosity, trust, gentleness, patience, and tolerance. But why those things? And why not other things? How do you define kindness? And even when we do define kindness, I think kindness has a bit of a public relations problem. I think it needs a new brand manager because kindness is not appealing to many of us. My four-year-old daughter uh, was given a book from some Christian friends about the fruit of the Spirit, and here it is. Cutie Fruities and the Fruit of the Spirit. 
Uh, it's one of those scratch and sniffs books. So if you open it up, you can actually scratch the pages. And this one here, Lily Love, smells like strawberry. Lovely. And it has characters such as Sophie Self-Control, Pippa Peace, Gabby Goodness, and Katie Kindness. But what do you notice about all those characters? They're all girls. I think for many in society, and many within the church sadly, these virtues, especially kindness, is seen as a feminine thing. It's something that's for girls and not for boys. And so kindness gets relegated to women. And men feel like they can choose to ignore this important virtue and instead focus on fighting and the warrior images of the Bible. Uh, church historians call this muscular Christianity, a phenomenon that's led to disastrous outcomes for churches and especially male leaders when they neglect kindness or see it as a second-rate option for the Christian life. Where are the books in Kurong with Patience Patrol or GI Gentleness? Sir, yes, sir, please. Because <laughs> in fact, one of the most famous male warriors in the Bible was a guy named David who killed bears and lions and giants and fought with armies. The most militarily successful man in the Old Testament. And in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And David said, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? King David, the warrior king, shows kindness. Kindness is not only for women. We've allowed the world's thinking to unintentionally restrict this amazing gift that God gives to his people. Secondly, though, I don't think kindness only has a PR problem in being associated with women. I think it also suffers from being seen as ineffective or pointless. The early Catholic Church, when translating the Bible into Latin, uh, chose this word for kindness, benignitas. Benignitas. Uh, but the word benign, when you have a benign lump in your body, that's a lump that is not going to spread and is not going to kill you. It's a harmless lump. It's an ineffective lump. I had a benign lump on the back of my neck this year. It was taken out only because it was bothering me, not because it was going to kill me. And I think we can fall into the same trap of seeing kindness as benign. It's passive. It's weak. It's useless in the 21st century. It turns you into a doormat for other people to trample on. Because our world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's survival of the fittest out there. And so, sure, if you want to be nice, if you want to be kind, you can. But if you want to succeed in life, if you want to get ahead, if you want to do well, then you cannot be kind. Kindness only makes you weak and vulnerable. Sure, you can let someone go ahead of you in the grocery checkout line, but that will slow you down and you'll be late for your next appointment. Sure, you can give money to charity and to church, but you won't be able to afford what other people can. It's not smart, it's not savvy, it's not even tax deductible in most circumstances. Kindness is seen as only relevant for half the population, or even worse, as completely irrelevant today. And in doing this, I think Satan has told us one of his great lies, that kindness isn't for us. Or that we're already kind and so we don't need to bother about looking at kindness. But to understand the fruit of the Spirit and what the fruit of the Spirit looks like, you need to go back to the fruit tree that the fruit came from. Fruit comes from trees, not from Woolworths. And so if you want to get the fruit, you need to go back to the source, the tree. And funnily enough, the fruit of the Spirit comes from the Spirit, who is God. And so we need to understand God's definition of kindness, to let the one true living God define for us what true kindness looks like in himself, and to let him produce this fruit in our lives as a response of thankfulness to the gospel. And so we'll look briefly today at God's kindness in the Bible before thinking about how we are to imitate him in our lives by expressing kindness towards other people. But as we begin today, I want to propose a working definition, which I hope you'll see then describes the complexity the variety and the exciting possibilities of what kindness can look like in the Bible. Okay, so here it is. Kindness is sacrificially doing the good and loving action for another person, regardless of whether they deserve it. Kindness is sacrificially doing the good and loving action for another person, regardless of whether they deserve it. Uh, in the Bible, the word kindness only gets mentioned 29 times. That's a bit sad. In the Old Testament, kindness only occurs 19 times in our English Standard Versions of the Bible. But each time it occurs, it's translating a Hebrew word that actually occurs 245 times in the Old Testament. That's the Hebrew word chesed. 
Most of the time, the word chesed is translated as love. But it can also be translated as steadfast love, or loyalty, or goodness, or mercy, or favor, or a whole bunch of other things there on the screen. And these ideas, they kind of overlap a little bit, like a Venn diagram, all trying to describe and grasp and articulate this idea of chesed. And biblical scholars have had a hard time trying to bring this word into English because at its heart, it's about loving kindness, but it's, it's more than that as well. Because I love pizza, okay? That kind of love is not chesed. I love my footy team, and that kind of love is not chesed. A chesed is about loyal covenant love. It's the idea of acting in love towards someone because of a pre-existing contract or deal that you have made towards them. It's a bit like marriage love. Marriage is not just about feelings. Marriage is about a contract, a deal where you promise to love your spouse in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer, till death do you part. And that contract, that agreement that we've already made, means that if I wake up one day and my wife is sick, I don't get to choose whether I feel like loving her that day. I act in chesed, in kindness, in loyal love to her based on the contract and promises that I made to her on my wedding day. And it doesn't matter if we had a fight the night before or if I'm upset with her because she uh, forgot to take out the garbage bins. I don't act towards her based on my feelings or my most recent experiences I act in kindness, in love, because of those prior promises and the contract that we've already made. And this is a special kind of love and kindness. This kind of love gives you certainty. It gives you security within your relationships. You don't need to worry that the other person is potentially going to abandon you because you've had a bad day. This kind of love casts out fear because you know in advance how the other person will respond to you. And so we see evidence all throughout the Bible of God's covenant kindness towards his people. It's not spontaneous acts of kindness, but promised faithful acts of loving kindness. Kindness that is predictable without being tameable. And so let's look at what God's kindness is like in the Bible. Firstly, God's kindness is seen in the way that he provides for his people, sustaining them in their daily needs. Uh, look with me at Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, which will appear on the screen in a second. Uh, Naomi uh, has endured this famine, and she's lost her husband, she's lost her two sons, and she's living below the poverty line. And she has this distant relative named Boaz, and he allows Ruth, her daughter-in-law, to go and gather extra food from his fields. And look at verse 20, it says, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. The Lord, God, has shown his kindness, his love towards his people by providing for their physical, material needs. Because not only is God your creator, according to the Bible, God is also your sustainer. He is the one who today continues to give you breath and food and water and clothing and everything that you need for sustenance. And God's kindness is seen in his provision for our material needs. But secondly, God provides for our spiritual needs in providing redemption or forgiveness. We see glimpses of that even in the previous passage because straight after Naomi talks about God's kindness in providing for material needs, she goes on to say, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Now for Naomi living under the old contract, the old covenant, the redemption she's talking about is a material redemption. Her family land had been forfeited and was about to be... uh, lost to others, but Boaz has this opportunity to redeem or to buy back the family's inheritance at a costly price. But later on in the new covenant, the new contract, Jesus talks about redemption as a greater and more significant spiritual reality, that by his blood, Jesus paid the price to buy back the life that you and I had forfeited by our sin. And we see glimpses of that in other parts of the Old Testament, like in Psalm 51, where King David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. That word steadfast love there in verse 1 is the same word translated as kindness elsewhere in the Old Testament. David appeals to God to forgive him because of God's kindness. Because God is the kind of God who will sacrificially do the good and loving thing for another person, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. 
Uh, God's kindness is seen in the way that he forgives people who sin when they don't deserve that forgiveness. Thirdly, God's kindness is seen in the way that he delays judgment on people who rightly deserve it. Look with me at Romans chapter 2 on the screen. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those practices, who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And we see two things here. Firstly, that God shows his kindness to rebellious people by holding back his judgment for a time. By not immediately giving us what we deserve the moment that we rebel against him. Because the punishment for mutiny or treason is death. And the moment that we turned our backs on God, that is what we deserved. But in his kindness, the fact that you have a pulse today is a kindness from God as he delays. He delays but doesn't downplay his righteous judgment and justice. But secondly, notice there's a purpose to this delay. According to verse 4, God's kindness, his patience, is meant to lead us to repentance. The times that God gives us here on earth are not meant to be lived in further ignorance of or opposition to him. These times we live in are a warning bell, giving us time to come back to him and to ask for forgiveness and mercy while we still can. It's like an amnesty, time for us to not receive what we deserve so that we can have our relationship with God restored and repaired through turning to Jesus. And fourthly, we see God's kindness is not in conflict with his justice. It's not like God is only ever kind to people and nice to them. Our world likes to think that if God is a loving God, then he must never do anything harsh or unpleasant. But look at how Romans 11 juxtaposes and contrasts these things. It says, Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you too will be cut off. God's kindness doesn't cancel out his judgment. It doesn't mean that he's gone soft in his old age. God is able to be both kind and severe at the same time. And so kindness is not niceness as our world would assume. We need a more robust and rigorous and complex understanding of what real kindness looks like. Fifthly, God's kindness is not just an idea, it's a person. Look with me at Titus chapter 3 verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's not very kind at all. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Do you notice in these verses it says that kindness is something that appeared. Now usually in the Bible when something appears, it's not an inanimate object like a rock or a tree or even an animal, but most of the time in the New Testament, when something appears, it's talking about a person, and particularly it's talking about salvation. Kindness appearing doesn't seem to make any sense. Maybe Paul's being poetic and personifying kindness as someone who appears, but I think it's more likely that he's describing that kindness was personified in history when God became human in the man Jesus Christ, and that kindness walked among us. Kindness, Jesus, saved us and washed us clean from our sin, as Titus describes. Because the kindness of God, the love of God, is ultimately a person. And so, yes, God's kindness is seen in the sunsets, as we sit on the beach and watch the sun go down. Or when you get a promotion from work, that is a kindness of God. If you get married, that is a kindness from God. If you have children, even at 2 a.m., they are a blessing and kindness from God. All these material things that we enjoy and delight in are kindnesses from God that we should thank him for. But the supreme and the central kindness from God is Jesus, his son. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. God's kindness towards you is found in Christ Jesus. And so having seen all the various ways that the Bible is described 
uh, describes God as being kind in the Bible, how does that then shape and inform our view of what it means for us to be kind today? What is our response to God's kindness? Well, firstly, the first response we need to have to God's kindness is to receive it. Because for many of us, we probably jump straight ahead to how we can imitate God's kindness and be like him. But before you can give kindness, you need to receive the kindness of God. The Christian life is not like karma or that idea of paying it forward. You cannot give back to God or impress him with your kindness. For most of us as self-made Aussies, we struggle to receive kindness from other people. We say things like, oh, you shouldn't have, or oh, there's no need to do that. That's the whole point of kindness. There was no need to do that, and yet they still chose to do that kind thing. It's like when someone invites you over for dinner, and you ask if you can bring anything, and they say, no, just bring yourself. The host at that moment has just shown you an incredible act of kindness, of generous love, and rather than receive it with joy and thankfulness, we feel this need to go and buy chocolates or something to make ourselves feel better. Like somehow we have earned their invitation by bringing them chocolates. But God is not like the average Aussie dinner host. At his banquet, when he says, don't bring a thing, he really means it. He says, come as you are, and he will provide everything in his kindness. And in fact, if you think you can bring anything to the table, you will actually miss out on being led in to that table. And so if you're someone here today who isn't yet a Christian, the most important thing you can take away from today is that God does not primarily want you to be kind and be nice. First and foremost, what God wants you to do is to receive his loving kindness. And if you haven't yet done that, or don't really understand how or why God is kind, then please come and grab myself or Carl or someone else here today, and we'd love to share this life-changing news with you. Our first response to God's kindness has to be to humbly receive it, and nothing else. But secondly, once you have tasted God's kindness and you have seen how good he is, the Spirit of Christ, the kind one, the Holy Spirit, he will not leave you as you are. He will conform you and transform you daily to become more and more like Jesus. Jesus is kind and so his people, as they're united to him, become kinder and kinder with every passing day. And this kindness is not a new thing that suddenly pops up in the New Testament. All the way back in the Old Testament, it was expected that God's people would be kind. Look with me at the famous verse from Micah chapter 6. You want to know what God requires of you today? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. God requires you to love kindness. Do you love it? Or do you see it as an optional extra or irrelevant to your Christian life? The Bible shows us three main things about biblical kindness, which may sound surprising to the 21st century Australian. Firstly, kindness benefits you. Kindness benefits you. You. Most people think that you should be kind because it benefits other people, and it does, but the Bible says it's actually beneficial, it's in your best interest to be kind. Look with me at Proverbs 11:17. A man who is kind benefits himself but a cruel man hurts himself. Or Proverbs 21, 21, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. Living with kindness actually benefits you because when God made the world, when he made humans, he made us as relational beings, people who were made to reflect his loving kindness and his character. And so the best way for us to live, to operate in this world that he has made, is with kindness. Kindness is woven into the fabric of the created universe that we live in. And life works best in God's world when we operate according to the manufacturer's instructions. God knows what is best and he tells us that kindness is the best way for you to live your best life. And this is surprising because our world tells us that kindness doesn't benefit you. It may help someone else, the recipient, but it doesn't help the giver. Secondly, Kindness is pivotal to power. Proverbs 20:28 20, says, Steadfast love and faithfulness preserve the king, and by steadfast love his throne is upheld. Again, that word steadfast love there is the word kindness. 
Kindness preserves the rulers and upholds their power. Now I bet when you think of kind people, you don't often think of powerful kings or political leaders. You might describe them as strong or assertive, manipulative even, but kindness is not a word we often associate with our leaders. The people our world thinks of as kind are the volunteers or grandmas baking cookies or humble people with little power in the world, the underdogs. But that's because our world forgets the importance of kindness to those who exercise power and authority. And this is not something new. Jesus saw it and he called it out in his day. He said, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. True leadership, our true authority is about serving, about loving and showing kindness to those you are responsible for. And Jesus tips our world's corrupted view about power and leadership by his teaching here upside down. But more importantly, by his example on the cross as he died in our place, the king showed us what true kindness and authority looks like. And thirdly, in the Bible, kindness is something you learn. It's not something that's natural to you. Look with me at Proverbs 31, the famous passage about an excellent wife. It says in verse 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Now this amazing woman in Proverbs 31, she opens her mouth and teaches other people how to be kind. I was reading some research the other day preparing for this and some researchers have recently uh, proposed a few years ago that humans are born with intrinsic or innate kindness. We're just born as kind people and it's the world out there that corrupts us. Or as we saw earlier, Helgas want you to believe that deep down Aussies are kind and altruistic people at our core. But the Bible surprises us and says, no, you're not. Deep down, you're not a naturally kind person. And even when you do kind things, it's God in his kindness restraining you from being as bad as you could possibly be. And so we need to be taught how to be kind. It is something external to you. It's not something that you discover within you as you listen to your heart and follow your dreams. You and I need to learn kindness. We need to learn it from our parents. We need to learn it from one another within the Christian community. But ultimately, we need to learn it from God as he defines in his word what is and isn't kind in any given situation. And so given that kindness is so good for us, why aren't we more kind? Isn't it simple? You know, stop being unkind, start being kind. Why is it such a problem for us? Well, ultimately, the reason why all of us struggle to be kind is because of sin. Sin is when we rebel against God, our King, and we make ourselves the rulers and the queens of our own little worlds instead of letting Jesus rule. And when we turn away from God, we begin to turn inwards on ourselves. Our hearts twist inwards and we focus on ourselves as the centre of our universe. Uh, Martin Luther called this incurvatus in se, which is Latin for turned or curved inward on oneself. It's not a good thing. But keeping in mind that sin is the ultimate problem, we can also examine some of the practical barriers that stop us from showing kindness today, which we can work on. Because failing to show kindness towards others is actually an offence towards God. It says in Job chapter 6, verse 14, he who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. So here are some practical barriers that stop us from embracing and pursuing kindness today. Number one, anger or harshness. Anger is the opposite of kindness, isn't it? It's hard to be kind with someone when you're angry with them. And it's hard to be angry with someone when you're being kind to them. Sometimes we don't show kindness to others because we don't want to show kindness to them. We don't love them and we don't think that they deserve it. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have experienced the undeserved kindness of God in the gospel, then you realize just how much God loves the unlovely. God shows his love, his kindness towards us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still God's enemies, Christ died for us. God did the kind thing even when we were literally spitting in his son's face. And so if you struggle with anger or harshness towards others, I want to ask how are you going to deal and let go of that anger? Do you need to be the one who initiates reconciliation and forgive that person who has hurt you? 
Do you need to show kindness to those people you don't like, those ones who are your enemies? It's hard, but the answer is to get a bigger picture of the gospel, to put your anger into perspective and to see how offensive and painful your sin was before a holy God and to realize the depths and the riches of his kindness towards you in Jesus. In light of what God has done for you, you can learn to let go of your anger, whether it's deserved or not. Secondly, we can fail to show kindness because of apathy. We're not angry with others, we just don't care. And in our world, I think that's been exacerbated because of the online connectivity that we experience. In past generations, your horizons in life were pretty small and localised. My late father never owned a passport and never travelled overseas except to go to Tasmania. His area of concern and influence and thought in the world was limited fairly locally to his physical geography. But for many of us, we've travelled the world, we're connected to people all over the world via the internet, and our area of concern and influence transcends our physical limitations. There are so many problems out there in the world and so many people who need our kindness, and so we feel exhausted by it all. And so the easiest way for us to deal with that is to tune out to shut down our hearts and to protect them from the barrage of information and causes that alert us every week. But I want to suggest that's not an option for the Christian. We cannot close our hearts to those in need of kindness. But I also want to encourage us that God calls on us to be faithful with what he has given us and not to be faithful with what he hasn't given us. Superman can fly around the world and rescue everyone, but you cannot. And so learn how to invest kindness in some things without being overwhelmed by everything. Thirdly, confusion means we often mistake what real kindness looks like. In Adelaide, we pride ourselves on being kind, on being polite, unlike those rude and brash East Coasters in Sydney and Melbourne. But we can confuse politeness or niceness with kindness. Proverbs 27.6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Kindness means sometimes wounding people in love, rebuking them, warning them of the current dangers of their behaviour and choices. And sometimes being polite is a sign of unkindness, of not loving that person enough to speak the truth of them to them about their danger, of being negligent as a friend. We need to let God's word keep reshaping our view of what actual kindness looks like. If you want somewhere to start, can I suggest maybe read through the book of Proverbs this month to see what a kind life looks like. Fourthly, laziness can prevent us from doing the thing that is kind towards another person. Sometimes our world talks about doing random acts of kindness, that it needs to be sporadic and spontaneous, and so we never get around to doing anything. We just wait for it to fall across our path. But kindness requires us to be intentional to be self-controlled with our time and our money so that we can love other people well, to have margin in our life with time and finances to care for other people. The Helga's Bread Report found that 34% of Aussies are what they call unbound enthusiasts. That is, they love to be kind as opportunities arise in the moment. They don't want to plan things but just wait for it to happen spontaneously. Now, that can be good. We want to be able to care for people as things arise, but being intentional with our kindness can also be a great blessing and avoid the trap of laziness. Fifthly, polluted inputs can warp our views of what is desirable about kindness today. The most popular TV show at the moment, apparently, is the Netflix series Squid Game. I'm not going to ask if you've seen it. Uh, I haven't, but so many people have been talking about it that I decided to read up on Wikipedia what it's all about. And can I say, it's not a TV show that promotes kindness. And yet its popularity means that millions of people around our world are being influenced by extreme forms of violence and brutality and harshness and entertaining themselves on unkindness, like the Romans watching the gladiators in the Colosseum. And sure, we say, oh, it's just harmless TV, it doesn't affect what I do. But it's not true. There are stories all over the nation of children in playgrounds now acting out these horrific games. We become what we consume. If you put in unkindness long enough, eventually what comes out of you will be unkindness. It's why Paul tells us in Philippians 4 verse 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. 
One of the reasons we may struggle with kindness is because we are consuming so much stuff that promotes the very opposite of kindness. And finally, tunnel vision can limit our thinking about how to show kindness towards our neighbour. We think about what others would like us to do for them, and we think that's a pretty good deal. Jesus himself says, "Whatever, sorry, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This sounds good, right? I wish for a beef and bacon burger, so I should go and buy someone else a beef and bacon burger. That's the kind thing to do, right? But what if they're a vegetarian? Because each of us gives and receives kindness differently. Some of you may be familiar with the concept of the five love languages, that some of us receive kindness as either words of affirmation or quality time or physical uh, touch or acts of service or receiving gifts. We need to not only do what we would like, but to also consider the unique person that we're trying to be kind to and to ask them and be informed from them about what they would experience as kindness in a situation. We also need to grow in thinking expansively about the different possibilities for kindness. It doesn't always involve bringing people food, although that's a great thing to do. It might involve offering to babysit someone's kids or sponsoring someone financially. It could be a a word of encouragement sent via text message to someone who's going through a tough time. Kindness has so many different possibilities. But please, go and ask someone what they would find helpful. Ask, would it be helpful if I brought you a meal? They can say yes or no depending on your cooking ability. But don't get stuck in that tunnel vision about what kindness looks like. Be creative, have fun, and explore the possibilities. Love people extravagantly. Now, we could go on and on, but what I want to do as I end today is help you realize that the struggle to be kind is normal. But also, what also is normal is progress in the Christian life. And so if you're someone here today who isn't a Christian and you wonder why Christians seem to be hypocrites at times, saying we should be kind but so often not doing it, it's because Christians are not perfect people. At least not yet. Christians are progressive people. They progress day by day to become a little bit more like Jesus as time goes on. Christians are people who realize daily their need for grace for God's kindness to help them when they struggle to live out this new identity, when those old ways of harshness and anger resurface. But Christians are people who also, rather than beating themselves up or giving up on this new kindness, they look up to Jesus to find grace and mercy, to find his kindness in their time of need. And I want to suggest that that is the beauty of the Christian life. It's not a life free of sin and struggle, a life of perfect kindness all the time, but it's a life in the process of transformation with the assurance and the safety of a secure relationship with God because of Jesus, because of God's covenant love, his chesed, his kindness towards you. And so if you are someone here today who is a Christian and you find this struggle to be kind really difficult, be encouraged. When the Bible tells you to do something, it's not because it's obvious or easy You shouldn't be surprised when kindness is a struggle. But on the other side, you shouldn't give up either. Day after day, in the power of God's kindness, when you fail, instead of covering up, you should own up to God and find the forgiveness and the renewal that comes through his Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a kind Father. You are not harsh with us, but over and over again, you have shown your extravagant kindness to us in making us, in sustaining us, and in redeeming us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we see the depths and the riches of your kindness in the gospel. Father, I pray for anyone here today who doesn't yet know the riches of your kindness and struggles to see how the God that they've heard about growing up could be kind. Father, I pray that by your spirit, you might reveal yourself through your word as the one who you really are, the kind God. And that today or this week, they might put their trust in Jesus, the epitome of kindness. And Father, we also pray for those of us who are followers of Jesus, that we would be more like our Savior. That we would reflect his kindness in a world which devalues or ignores or sidelines kindness. Help us to regather and to to retreasure this important virtue. 